Okay, good good evening. Happy Sabbath. For those that it's Sabbath, and it's going to be Sabbath soon here, well, in a couple hours. But anyway, let's uh, begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we have here this evening. We look forward to the Sabbath and the blessings of fellowship and for the blessings of your spirit, the peace that we can have and uh, the rest that we can have that symbolizes our rest from sin and ultimately uh, the rest of the universe from sin. And um, we just pray, Lord, that uh, uh, we can trust in you, that we can depend upon you in all things. We're thankful for the relationships that we have um, in this movement and those around us and the witness that we have um, to, to those that we meet. And we just pray, Lord, that as we study here this evening, the things we learn will help us as we face the character defects that we have and as we uh, behold Christ. We pray for each person studying these things and we ask that your Holy Spirit can be here now and we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening again. So, A.T. Jones, number six, Third Angel's Message, uh, series done in 1895. A long time ago, right? I mean, this is a long time ago. But what we see is that what Jones is presenting, what he's experiencing in that history is typical of what is occurring in this history. Now, when it comes to the topic of righteousness by faith, and especially in the context of the third angel's message, I've been an Adventist for a long time, and this has always been my main presentations that I, I did whenever I did sermons, talked, did Sabbath school, I would always focus upon righteousness by faith and um, read lots of uh, A.T. Jones quotes and Wagner quotes and, of course, Ellen White quotes on the topic, as well as studied many of these passages of scripture that Jones is presenting here. And I read all of Jones' works that were available to me back in the 1990s. Um, there's obviously a little bit more here that's not available, that wasn't available to me back then that you can get on the, the CD-ROM, some of those things I haven't read all the way through. Um, and I don't think I read Ecclesiastical Empire all the way through. Uh, I got bogged down with all those uh, um, popes, but one day maybe I should read that book again. Got like halfway through. So, but everything that he wrote about righteousness by faith, I've read and studied, but, one of the things before I came into this movement that I never understood was the first and second angels messages and that they also are righteousness by faith. And so when Ellen White says that righteousness by faith is the third angels message in verity or the third angels mess, I can't remember which order it goes in, <clears throat> but I think that's the way it goes. We just think, Oh, the third angel's message is righteousness by faith. The first and second angel's messages, while they precede the third, they're not righteousness by faith. But what we came to understand is when she says the third angel's message in verity, what she means is the experience of righteousness by faith is manifest in the third angel's message. But that doesn't mean that the first and second angel's messages aren't righteousness by faith. They are. They're necessary steps because if we, this movement takes the position that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that dem develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So the everlasting gospel has to be righteousness by faith, and it has to occur in three steps, three-step testing message. So when you get to the third step, you are manifesting a Christ-like character. Now, we know that we don't manifest a Christ-like character. We 
We struggle with sin. We struggle with self. So that means we're not really to, to the completion of this three-step testing prophetic message. Now, of course, there, there's more to it than that because there's, there's the message as it's presented throughout history and the message as it applies to us as individuals. And we know as individuals, those that are seeking to perfect Christian character will never indulge the thought that they are sinless. Their, their lives may be irreproachable. They may be living representatives of the truth that they profess, but the closer to the come to Christ, the more sinful they appear in their own eyes because they can discern more clearly their own defects, their own weaknesses. And so righteousness by faith is not about seeing yourself righteous. It is about depending upon Christ. Now, I say all that here in this study, uh, number six, Jones, and he has been addressing this, he's been addressing um, the difference between appealing to Caesar and trusting in God. And he shows that, that Paul, when he says, I appeal to Caesar, is only appealing to Caesar because he's in Caesar's possession and he's asking Caesar to obey his own laws. And the conflict that we have in this movement, in, in this world presently, is we do have sympathy, na a natural sympathy with certain political views. And um, we reject other political views. So that is, even though we, we aren't supposed to be political, uh, we, we live in a world where politics is everywhere and our um, natural common sense tells us that some things are wrong and some things are right. But we know as Christians that politics itself is never an answer to the problems that exist in the world. It can be a deceptive um, uh, temptation to think that, you know, we need to stand up for our rights. And Paul isn't doing this here, right? So we're going to see that. We can see how then it relates to what we are facing in this world today. So, and what we're facing in this world today is the Sunday law. That's what Jones is facing. And so in the context of the Sunday law, we need to understand the principles in which we function and operate when our rights are going to be taken away from us and knowing what the right thing to do is. So, so this is an important point, but from this, what he's going to do is he's going to show the principles of how righteousness by faith is practically worked out in this world. That is, we're going to face persecution. How do we respond to that as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians who are seeking to keep the Sabbath? And, and th so that's what Jones is addressing. So if we, if we take the time to understand his arguments, what he's doing, we see that this is witnessing to us regarding the principles of the gospel. So anyway, we're going to begin reading here. And it's about 11 pages, I think, or 10 or 11 pages. So it's not going to take us long to read. Some of his other studies in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin were 20 pages. So this is a little shorter. There are two or three other scriptures that we will notice in the line of study that we've been following the past three evenings. And we will begin where the lesson stopped last night, Acts 25, verse 11, with the words, I appeal unto Caesar. We followed the record last night from its beginning up to that point and found that in the common view of that subject, Paul never did appeal to Caesar. After Caesar had taken him, Paul held Caesar to his own principles and laws. The particular principle that we are studying now is the right of the citizen of the kingdom of God, an ambassador of Christ, 
to require other kingdoms and authorities to conform strictly to their own rules and laws that govern themselves in their dealings or in their dealing with him. The 16th chapter of Acts is another, beginning with the 16th verse. They were at Philippi. Um, so where are they there in the Acts chapter 16? Um, So I want to know where they were. So he says they were at Philippi. So Philippi, P H I L I P P I. Okay, so in Acts, he says in Acts 16, um, they went uh, thence to Philippi, which is the chief city. So this is going to be in verse 12. Now, I know there's different cities that are called Philippi, right? So this isn't Caesarea Philippi. This is some other Philippi because it's in Macedonia. Um, okay. So I was just wondering whether it was Caesarea Philippi or not, but it's not. Okay. <clears throat> it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. Met us. Okay. Um, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul being grieved turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. And these were Roman rulers too, because uh, Philippi was a Roman colony and had special privileges from the emperor. And then he goes on with the Bible verse and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs, which are not lawful for us to receive neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates, magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And they said, no, we appeal to Caesar, didn't they? They did not. But they were Roman citizens, were they not? Why didn't they appeal to Caesar then? Were they not about to be abused and beaten? What would, it, what would you have done? No, we need not say. What would you have done? But what are you going to do? That is the question now. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas praise, prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Then follows the account of the earthquake and the conversion of the jailer and his household and their baptism. Now the 35th verse. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying, uh, saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly con uncondemned being Romans and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. They violated every Roman law that governed themselves in their city. Now they want us to go sneaking out of this place. No, sir, you come and take us out. 
You put us in here, take us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. There is another passage in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, 25 to 25, speaking of those who are boasting of their standing and so on. Paul says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Now that beating with rods was the Roman punishment. Of course, the Jews were limited by the law to 40 stripes, save one. Five times he got that. But this beating with the rods is, was not simply Jewish whippings, but Roman scourgings, beating with the Roman rods, and he a Roman citizen. And we have no record anywhere that he ever appealed to Caesar under any such circumstances or any circumstances at all. When Caesar had taken him and kept him over two years in prison, and then wanted to deliver him up to the Jews, then to Caesar or Caesar's lieutenant, he said, no, sir, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, or I ought to be judged, I appeal unto Caesar. Question from the audience. Uh, why did he even then appeal to his Roman citizenship instead of to his heavenly ambassadorship? Jones answers, what I am saying is that he did depend upon his heavenly am ambassadorship and upon his heavenly king. Until the Roman power had taken him under its jurisdiction, and then he simply held the Roman authorities to the Roman law. But in the common idea that has been held on this subject, you would get the idea that Paul appealed to his Roman citizenship on every occasion when there was any danger. And the fact is that he never did it at all. Three times at least he received Roman scourgings and made no use of his claim to Roman citizenship, made no appeal whatever to the civil power. But when he was taken into their hands and held under their control and kept within the power of Rome, then, and not till then, did he make any use of the Roman power. But then when the Roman captain was about to scourge him, which was unlawful, Paul said, it is not lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned. Under these circumstances, and under no others, did he ever make an, any appeal or to or any use of the Roman power to make any use of his Roman citizenship. For when he went preaching the gospel, and whenever he went, he was mobbed. Wherever he went, he was mobbed. He was stoned. He was shamefully entreated. And yet, in the whole record, there's no hint of his ever, in any case, making any appeal to any earthly power or use or any use of his Roman citizenship. Now, if this was all written for our example and for our learning, then it is this that we are to learn. Then is this what we are to learn and is not about time we were learning it? It's an awkward sentence, but anyway. Um, he put his trust in God, the sovereign of the kingdom to which he belonged and where his true citizenship lay. Why shall we not do the same? Daniel was in the country of Babylon and Medo-Persia. That is true. And whenever the time comes that one nation should come with its armies against the country where you are, or may be sojourning, and shall take you with a great multitude of people and bind you and carry you off to their own country and keep you as slaves of the king, and the king shall put you in his palace, in his service, then you can decide easily enough, I think, whether there is not a difference between that and voluntarily seeking for political position. This is the record in my Bible about Daniel and how he got there. And when your turn comes and you get into such a place as that, I don't suppose anybody would find any objection to your serving the king in the place he puts you. But as long as you are at liberty to keep out of such places as that, I do not think you can cite Daniel as a justification for your deliberately going in there in the face of the plainest teachings of Christ. Now, he he's not really answering a question. So he's, he's bringing up a topic, right, which is sort of implied by the discussion. And, and an excuse that people often use to be involved in politics, they'll say, well, Daniel was a politician, right? 
he, he was a ruler. He was, he, was, he was in the leadership position in the government in some manner. So we should be able to do that. But Daniel was there by choice. He was put, put there by God. Same with Joseph. Joseph is the Pharaoh's right-hand man. But Joseph isn't there out of his own choice. So what Jones is trying to, to get here to here is what, what responsibility do we have to the laws of the land? And um, if we're ambassadors, can we be imprisoned, so to speak? Um, he's going he's gonna to explain this a bit more, but this is just one of those points that people often bring up. So if I were taken captive as Daniel was and was appointed by the king, as some of Daniel's people are or were, to brick making and building the walls of Babylon around about, I suppose I should work in the brickyard. And if the king should take me out of, of there and send me to school, as he did Daniel and some of his brethren, I think it is altogether likely I should go in, on in school and study to the best of my ability. And after I had done that, if he should take me out and put me in his palace as a doorkeeper, I should perform the office of a doorkeeper. And if he should finally even bring me into his court to stand before the king, as the record is of Daniel and his three brethren, I should stand before the king. And if I should be honest and faithful enough, and God should give me wisdom to interpret deep things to the king as God gave to Daniel, and the king should appreciate God's blessing in that enough to honor God for it and should at last put a chain of gold around my neck and put me in position next to the king, I should stand there. But I am satisfied that until that time does come and such circumstances as that do arise, I would not be justified in running for political or any other kind of office, nor in taking any political steps to get somebody else elected, nor in taking any part in city government or state government, nor in national government, nor in politics of any kind. Jesus Christ did not, and he says, you're not of this world, even as I am not of this world. As my Father sent me, even so send I you. And as he is, so are we in this world. Joseph was sold by his brethren, was bought and made a slave, was carried into Egypt as a slave, sold there as a slave, and served as a slave. His integrity to God and faithfulness to his law got him into prison, and there he remained quite a while. His faithfulness there, his quiet demeanor, the atmosphere of the Spirit of God that was with him gave him favor in the sight of the jailer, who put him in charge of the doors and the other prisoners round about. What now would be called a uh, trustee in the penitentiary? And God was with him still. The time came when God would prepare for the salvation of Israel, that is, Jacob and his family and all Israel to come. And he gave to Pharaoh remarkable dreams, as he did to Nebuchadnezzar in the days of Daniel. The king sent for Joseph, and he interpreted the dream for Pharaoh. Pharaoh wanted somebody to take charge of the matters that had been arranged to prepare Egypt against the famine that was to come. Said Pharaoh, who knows as much about this as the man who knows who knows as much about this as the man who knows all about it therefore the one that knows about this the one that has explained it and told us what is going to come is the one to take charge of it and carry it out i put everything into egypt i put everything in egypt into his hands only in the throne will i be above him everything in all egypt pharaoh gave to joseph's care and if you ever get into such a position as that, through such experience as that, as that, I do not think that even I would raise any objection to your performing the duties of the place to which you are thus called. But I do deny that these experiences, as my Bible gives them, have any bearing whatever upon the course of Seventh-day Adventists now, anywhere on the earth, who are in jail, free to choose, where they will go, um, who are out of jail, pardon me, free to choose where they will go and what they will do. Now, I want to state a little further upon the principle that no Christian, being a citizen of the kingdom of God, can of right start any procedure in the connection of the civil government. 
after it is started by the government itself? That is another question, and we have studied that. I repeat, therefore, that upon the principles which govern kingdoms and governments, the very principle of the law that underlies the whole subject of government, whether it be law in heaven or law on earth, a Christian cannot start any procedure in connection with civil government. And of all Christians, Seventh-day Adventists cannot do it. The very keeping of the Sabbath forbids it. For to submit a case to a court, he submits it to the procedure of the court. Now, every court in the land can go strictly according to law and to all the rules of the courts and hold court and try the case on the Sabbath. The Sabbath keeper cannot attend court on the Sabbath, but he has started the case himself. And in starting the case, he submits the case to the procedure of the court. Yet if the court in regular proceeding, even without any design, calls the case on the Sabbath, he will be required to attend on the Sabbath. And he cannot do this, though, and keep the Sabbath. But to refuse while st starting the case himself, it o is only a trifle with the court. Uh, is only to trifle with the court. That this the court cannot allow, and therefore may levy a fine for not attendance. But if the fine is paid, it is paid for keeping the Sabbath. If it is not paid, and he goes to prison instead, he cannot justly count it persecution because without any fault on the part of the court, it is only the straight consequence of his own action in starting the case. Therefore, the very words, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, forbids the starting of any case in court because that commandment forbids us to start on a course that may prevent the keeping of the Sabbath holy. And before I read, as I shall read that, I want to say that what I shall read is to meet an objection that is in the minds of a good many, that these things that are being brought out here are very wide of the mark. I've not heard any denial yet that the principle is there or that the principle is all right, but it is the following up of the principle that some do not accept. So there's a disagreement regarding how to apply this principle. Well, if you acknowledge a principle as a principle, which you are not willing to follow, wherever it goes, then you would better give up the principle. In order that all may know that it, this is not new, I shall read from the American Sentinel of 1893. Of course, the article was not dealing with the subject in the way that we are talking on it tonight, but it is the same principle, and the whole principle is there. And the certain consequences of the violation of the principle are also there. I read from the American Sentinel of July 6th, 1893, and I shall read perhaps the most of the article upon that subject. The Sunday managers resorted to the United States courts and got swamped the first thing. They called upon the courts to decide the question. The courts did decide the question, and now they refused to accept the decision. They submitted their cause to the courts and now refused to accept the decision because it was not on their side. Well, then, as they are determined to have their own way anyhow, what in the world did they want with the courts in the first place? Unless you are ready to accept the decision of a court of this world, you cannot voluntarily make any appeal to it. As certainly as you do, you are pledged by every principle of government, heavenly or earthly, to accept the decision and if it is against you, there is nobody to blame but yourself. And I say that that has been there all these two years. And yet in 1894, some Seventh-day Adventists went right over that ground and found themselves caught just as certainly as these national reformers did. However, the Seventh-day Adventists did not refuse to accept the decision. They accepted the decision but it was at the expense of their paying a fine for keeping the Sabbath. Under the circumstances, there was nothing else to do. I read on. Well then, as they are determined to have their own way anyhow, what in the world did they want with the courts in the first place? Ah, they only wanted to use the court as a tool in enforcing their own decision and their own will upon the people of the United States. And if this had been written in this month of February 1895 of some procedure of Seventh-day Adventists, 
Every word of it would have been exactly as it is. It need not be changed a particle. Now, I'm not bringing this as a charge or as a reproach or an accusation against the Seventh-day Adventist, any Seventh-day Adventist, or to find fault with any. I'm only stating the fact. I'm only sorry it is so, as sorry as I can be that it is so. But in the Bible, it is written. Now, all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And when we are ourselves in violation of the principles which we profess, go over the ground of national reformers themselves and get caught just as certainly as they did, then shall not we take warning from these examples as much as from those of our brethren in AD 30 or 40 in Judea? This principle is just as applicable in Maryland or any other state of the Union as it is in Judea or in Illinois. I say again, I'm not fault-finding or finding fault. I know all make mistakes. All that I am saying is, shall we not learn lessons from our own mistakes as well as from those of other people? I need not tell uh, where this occurred. It's not necessary that this should be known. The fact is, all that is needed for the place will be just where you are if you do not become better acquainted with principle than many now are. Calling attention again to the Sentinel, there comes in there a little history about their case as to what it was in the court, which I need not read. In coming back to the principle, we continue. Of course, it is always understood that especially the party which initiates legal procedure shall accept in good faith the final decision. With the other party, it is not necessarily so, for he may be dragged into it and forced into court by the course of the initiative, and he is not bound to accept any decision, because the whole procedure may be one of persecution, and therefore wrong from the beginning. But with the initiative, it is not so. It is the nature of things. It inheres in the very idea of legal government, that the party who resorts to the law, the party who begins legal procedure, shall accept in good faith the final decision. Otherwise, there's no use of legal government. Violence becomes the only procedure and might, and might the only source of appeal. And that is anarchy indeed. Then unless you as a citizen of the kingdom of God are ready to accept the decision of an earthly court, you cannot take the initiative. You cannot start the case. Because to start the case and then not to accept the decision is the principle of anarchy itself. It annihilates government. But Christians are not in the world for that purpose. We are here for another purpose. We are to recognize and to respect, without any question, the systems of government that are already established, as they are established by those who have established them, and not to inculcate a principle, nor to follow a course that can only annihilate the very foundations of the government that are governments that are here. Now, it is the everlasting truth that the Sunday party did take the initiative and have kept it from the first inception to the act of Congress clear up to its final decision of the court. And now, instead of accepting the final decision in good faith, they do not accept it at all, but resort to violence. The party of the second part, the party that was dragged in unto the procedure and into court, freely announces beforehand that if the decision is against them, they will accept it in good faith and so conform to it. The party of the first part, the party which takes and holds the initiative from the beginning, openly disregards and refuses to accept the final decision and boldly announces their purpose to pursue such a course as will make the fair a financial failure. And these are the ones who so scathingly denounce the course of the directory as anarchistic and rebellious. The sum of the whole matter is this. It is essential to the very idea and existence of legal government that the party who takes the initiative in legal procedure shall accept in good faith and so conform to the final decision. Not to do so, but to act the same as though there had been no decision after the final decision has been rendered is in itself to renounce legal government and is essentially anarchistic and rebellious. The Sunday Law Party is and has been from the beginning the party of the initiative 
in this legal procedure. This party, instead of accepting in good faith the final decision, ignores it entirely and resorts to violence, the boycott, after that decision has been rendered. It therefore follows inevitably, and the demonstration is complete, that the action of the Sunday managers in this matter is truly the action and the only one which is indeed anarchistic in conception and rebellious in execution. This is the logic of the situation, and it is the exact truth. Their very action only further illustrates it, and they're calling other people anarchists, rebels, traitors, atheists, and so on, can never disprove this abiding truth. This is the same conclusion to which we were forced last year by the logic of their course in securing the act of Congress require, requiring the closing of the fair. It is the only just conclusion that can ever be reached from the basis of ecclesiastical di dictation or control in the affairs of government. And this for the plain and simple reason that on the part of the ecclesiastics, it is ecclesiastics, it is never intended that they shall pay any respect, respectful attention to any law or any decision that does not suit them. Therefore, the only purpose for which they ever resort to either legislation or judicial procedure is that the governmental authority may be at their disposal with which to execute upon the people their arbitrary will. And this in itself is at once to sweep away all really just or properly legal government. And all this only makes the more manifest the divine wisdom, which commands the total separation of the ecclesiastical and the civil powers, which forbids the church to have any connection with the state. It also demonstrates the wisdom of the men who made the government of the United States in embodying in the constitution, the supreme law uh, and the supreme law, the divine idea for governance the total separation of church and state. And this, which has been done and is now being done by the churches, is only a hint and the beginning of the sea of troubles into which the government will be plunged and indeed finally sunk by this gross disregard of the governmental principle established by our fathers and announced by Jesus Christ. So long as the church keeps herself entirely separate from the state, she can consistently and rightly disregard any and all legislative acts, judicial decrees or executive powers put forth upon religious questions or that touch religious practices, because she ever denies the right of government to touch religion or any religious question in any way. And this is present truth. It is present truth for us, as well as for the national reformers. But when she forgets her place and her high privileges, and herself actually invites governmental jurisdiction of religious observances, she then, by so doing, and in justice, forfeit fits her power to, of protest and her right to disregard governmental commands in things religious, while in fact, and in practice, she refuses to let it go. So that whenever the government does not do according to her will, she openly and intentionally disregards the very authority which she herself has invoked. She thus becomes the chiefest example and source of lawlessness and the swiftest instrument of governmental ruin. And with us especially, as we have seen, this principle covers all cases. Shall we learn what the principle is indeed and stick to it? That is the question for us all. So um, I think we got, um, yeah, so we got about 15 minutes till eight o'clock here. Now, now, what do we see here that Jones is saying? So let's have a little bit of a discussion about this. What, what is Jones saying? How are we understanding what he's saying? Can anybody sum this up or? have comments on it. I mean, he hasn't stated explicitly how this relates to righteousness. But, but 
Ron, do you have a comment? Well, uh, it appears that he's basically condemning any kind of, of thing that would uh, go contrary to uh, the state's disposition and okay. can't can't go into anarchy <laughs> because that's that's what happens if you don't like you've been saying or like you've been saying yeah. uh, so, that's what happens if you, yeah. so if as, you accept the yeah yeah the authority right so we as ambassadors accept the authority of god's kingdom as ambassadors we expect that the laws of the land be respected, but we don't really, we're not under the power of, if, if we appeal to the power of the government, then we're actually appealing to a power outside of God's kingdom. So what happened to Paul when he appealed? Did well, he lose that appeal? Well, well, the thing is, he didn't really appeal. That's the point that Jones is making when he says, you know, uh, I appeal to Caesar. Oh, he was appealing just to that they would uh, go for their own rules. Yeah, they follow their own rules. Or their own rules. Because they would have released him to the Jews. But right. That was, that was illegal, right? He was under Rome's power at that time. So he submitted to the yeah. power of that government. But he wasn't, he, he didn't initiate, he wasn't there voluntarily. He had been taken prisoner and been held prisoner right. for two years. Right. Illegally. Illegally, yes. <laughs> I get it. And so none of it was to, it was his dependence upon God. Because he was in God's hands. He wasn't putting himself in the hands of of Caesar. He was already in the hands of Caesar. And, and then he was going to be released to, to the Jews, which was against Roman law. Because he's a Roman citizen. He rightfully should be tried by Rome. For them to sort of pass the buck wasn't really just. It, and it, so the principle that's here so the principle that Jones is trying to get us to understand is that we are not, our kingdom is not of this world because Jesus' kingdom is not, is not of this world. And, and we are not to try to make this world just. That is, we're not to use the power of the state. We're sojourners, right? Right. And so we know the principles of God's kingdoms, his law. We don't seek to have the state enforce God's kingdoms, God's laws. Because what Jones argues against is this idea that the United States is a Christian nation and that we should um, have the laws, God's government laws, be the law of the land that the laws of the land should be the Ten Commandments, right? Many Christians believe that, that the Ten Commandments should be the basis of, of law, and, you know, we should promote them. Um, we should, you know, have them displayed in, in, in... Well, that's the big argument, isn't it? You know, that's why some groups want to put the Ten Commandments in front of the courthouse, and other groups want it uh, in a warehouse. Well, and, and the point is that Jones makes in, in other uh, papers and books and articles and sermons um, is that the, the laws of the land are civil, not moral, and, and should be civil, not moral. That is, moral addresses the thoughts and intents of the heart. Right. Moral law has to do with character. Civil law just has to do with law, with actions. Nothing, it has no real concern about and should have no real concern about uh, what somebody believes or thinks. The question is, is an action wrong? 
according that's to the why justice is supposed to be blind that's part of the reason yes so so and when you when you go to court anybody who's ever been in court i mean they usually argue the law i mean obviously there's facts of the case and so forth but often the facts aren't really disputed what's disputed is the application of the law right lawyers argue law not very often do they argue facts it depends on the type of cases of course but I, i've been in court you know as witnesses and things like that um and and i've seen where they argued about law more than about the facts because the facts were pretty evident you know, tons of witnesses so um so when it comes to uh the principles that a christian operates on we operate on the principle that we are not of this world we are ambassadors um, for our country, which is a heavenly kingdom. And the message that we have is the gospel. Because we're seeking people's hearts, not just their conformity to, to some kind of action. I mean, it would do no good if, if the government came in and forced everyone to be, you know, in quotation marks, moral right? The idea that you can force somebody to be good through law, you can't, right? There's not a single law that can make somebody moral. Now, laws can enforce civility, but they can't enforce morality. You can bend the person so that he, he follows uh, right action that is he does the right things that appear moral but his heart's not going to be in it it's not going to save him it's not going to benefit him you can't change the heart right only the gospel can change the heart now when we look at the situation that we are presently in the world you know it's it's easy to feel you know that there's a lot of injustices being done. But one thing you will not find in this world is justice. Injustices will always occur. And so it's not really what happens to us that's unjust, that we experience injustices. What really matters is our reaction to what happens to us. So Paul wasn't really seeking justice in that sense because he already had that in Christ. So Jones is making an argument that Paul isn't really appealing to Caesar, even though that's what he says he's doing. Because not in the way that we commonly look at it. Because Paul didn't do it other times. So it, it's, it's an argument that sometimes people have a great difficulty with. Now, I, I grew up with my dad who believed in, you know, this, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, liberation theology. You know, all this idea of social justice, that we can make the world a better place. The United Church of Canada, like the United Methodists, very liberal, and, and to them, the role of the Christian is basically to be an activist and to call for justice, to make, to help people live a better life in this world. Those people who are treated poorly, our role and responsibility is to make sure that, you know, they're treated correctly by others. So that means getting the government involved in uh, justice, social justice. And of course, that's not the role of a Christian. It's not the role of Christianity. Because if that was the role, Christ would have done that. But he never sought social justice. All he did is preach the gospel because he wanted to reach the heart. Making this world a better place is not really our role because 
we want a heavenly place, right? We want to have people in a heavenly kingdom. Making the world a better place doesn't give them uh, entrance into heaven. They might live a little better life here on earth, but they'll just die and not enter into God's kingdom. <clears throat> so we're going to see, though, as we go through this, how this relates to us in the context of the Sunday law, but also in the context of righteousness by faith. Now, in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, one of the things that, that Jones tried to show is that the government, the, the, the power of the state is, if we seek the power of the state to help us, what's the, what's the problem with that? Can, can we fight the state with its own weapons? So how would be that how would that be trusting God? Well, and and see God is more powerful than the state, right? So if we right? if we seek the state, it, it's it's like um, in, it's an admission that the state's bigger than he is. Yeah, like in Isaiah chapter seven and eight, you know, you're going to have um, Ahaz. He's going to, instead of trusting in God, he's going to look to Assyria, right? Well, you're going to lose that battle, right? You're siding with the enemy. So in, in our trust in God, it means we're going to face many different difficult things. We're going to have to exercise faith. But we have to trust that God is in charge, that he has a purpose in everything that happens to us. But even in our own personal life and walk with God, often we want to see like the world wants to see. We want to see the victories in our lives. We want to be able to look at ourselves and see ourselves as good. But the Christian only sees himself as a sinner. If he sees himself as good, he's no longer a Christian. So anyway, we will see how this, how Jones works this all out in this, this series. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, so thanks for those comments. Any, anyone else have any thoughts on this before we close with prayer? Any ideas here? Any thoughts, comments, observations? Okay, so let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that we can keep these thoughts before us throughout the Sabbath to understand how we often trust in the arm of flesh rather than you. Help us to recognize in ourselves our lack of faith and trust in you. We know, Lord, you have a purpose and a plan for our lives, and we often are hindering that purpose and that plan. Forgive us for our sins, for how we hurt those around us, Forgive us for the words that we say to each other that are thoughtless and help us, Lord, to represent you in all that we do. Bless the Sabbath, bless the studies, uh, Dwight's study tomorrow morning and, um, and other studies that will follow. We just pray, Lord, that, um, that we can see in these things our need and that we can learn to depend upon you. Be with us now. Bless the Sabbath. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.